Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is of spirit. Do not be astounded that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you do not hear the sound of it. But you do not know how or where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may not have... Uh, May, believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord Christ. Please be seated. Today is the second Sunday in Lent, and we continue to get ready for Easter, for that is the purpose of Lent, to prepare us for this incredible holiday, this incredible celebration, to prepare us so that resurrection power can be unleashed in our lives. On Ash Wednesday, we began our journey in Lent, and we, we discovered the, how fragile, but yet how precious life is. Last week, we learned about temptations and how important it is to battle temptations in the community with the help of others. This week, we're going to read about, we've read about a clandestine meeting. A meeting between a Pharisee who comes in the darkness and the cover of night because he wants to have a conversation with Jesus. We don't know why he comes, it's in the middle of the night. Most likely, though, it's because he doesn't want anybody else to see. All of his colleagues are certainly would scorn him uh, because of their animosity and hatred towards Jesus. So here we have this clandestine meeting, and as Nicodemus, this Pharisee, comes to have a conversation with Jesus, he begins it by openly confessing, just, just to get it out there so that there's no confusion. Hey, Jesus, I know you're from God. No one could do the things that you do unless they were from God. So he's openly confessing that he's not against Jesus, and that he recognizes that Jesus is from God. What happens next is a somewhat theological conversation. And probably our biggest takeaway from this conversation is that Nicodemus can't figure it out. He doesn't understand what in the world that Jesus is saying. So if you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh, this is just ooh, right over my head, everything the pastor just read, well, you're in good company. Nicodemus doesn't quite understand. There seems to be a barrier in his belief system, in his worldviews, in his values that prevent him from really understanding what in the world Jesus is getting at. And so Jesus shapes this conversation in order to get right at what is preventing Nicodemus from truly connecting with God. Now this happens quite often, actually it happens in, in our lives in the church today. And I thought I'd come up with just a list of what are some common beliefs or values or principles that we tend to gravitate towards that because of their falsehood, they create a barrier between us and God. And so let's go to the first one. These are a couple just things or sayings or beliefs that people didn't have. Vengeance, it will make things better. Anybody ever hear about this? You can watch it in a movie. It's proclaimed loudly in our culture. I just get even 
Then I can have peace in my life. Then I can move forward and live. If that person just feels what I feel, then everything will be okay, right? This is an attitude or belief that people often adopt today, very willingly, because of the pain that we encounter, and we just, we just have to, we have to get back at them. They have to feel what I feel. And if they don't, well, then I, then I just can't move forward. This is a false belief, but often we embrace this idea in, in many different forms. And what do we do? It actually creates a barrier between us and the power of God being unleashed in our lives. A second one. If I had more money, and you could just add anything you want to that. If I had more money, then oh, then, then I could really do good works for God. If I had more money, then I'd have the free time, and I could really spend time with my family. If I had more money, if I had more money, if I had more money. Oftentimes, this mantra cripples our faith. It undermines who we are. And it thinks that I, I, I can't have real faith and real experiences with God because I just don't have enough money in order to be able to do that. It undermines the church, when the church thinks we can't do our mission unless we have more money, which is not true at all. Next one. When I have time, or when I get my life together, then I can meet God. You know, that's the old, ah, as soon as I get this done, then I can think about God. Then I can be spiritual. Then I can take care of all of that God stuff and everything, and all that church stuff. Oftentimes, people will embrace this idea as well. This will be a subtle assumption that we have in our lives, but it's one that influences how we make decisions and where we really place our priorities. If I only had more time, or if I could just get my life together, then I could deal with figuring out the whole faith thing. Next one. God cannot possibly love someone like me. If God really knew, if you really knew all the stuff that I've done, all the ways that I've failed God and people and myself, of all the dirty sins that I've done, the people I've hurt, there's just no way God love someone like me. The truth is, God does know all the dirty little things we've ever done or thought or wanted to do, and yet God still loves us anyway. Too often, people think this idea that somehow they have to do lovely things, be lovely people, or do good works, and then God loves them, and that's not how it works. But you can see how when you embrace this falsehood, how it can undermine your experience with God. Lesson. That's, this, is, this is one of the biggest ones, I think. God owes me. Look at all the good that I have done. This is a subtle attitude that often we can take to heart and we can believe in. And we can start to, to imitate or to, to, to even utter these words. I've done so many good things for God. I've given so much money to God. God owes me at least 42 blessings, right? We tend to, to take on this idea. And then when God doesn't give us what we want... We get disappointed and dejected and we give up on God. All of these are, are attitudes that we subtly can assume. They're assumptions that sometimes we have. They're values that we embrace. And all of them are not true, but yet we believe in them and they undermine our faith. That's what's going on with Nicodemus. He has a similar thing that he believes in. And because he believes in it, it's undermining his faith. Paul helps to illustrate that in Romans 9, what this belief was. Paul himself was a Pharisee as well. And it's this, my status, my standing before God is determined by what I do. That's what is at the heart of Nicodemus. And it created a pride in him. That created a barrier between him and God. So Jesus, in this secret conversation that he's having with Nicodemus, because Nicodemus shows up in the middle of the night, addresses him. And he goes right to the heart of the issue because he wants to dispel this understanding that somehow Nicodemus is more loved by God because of all the devotion that he has had towards following God and God's law. In fact, Jesus is going to spell it out and say, hey, there's nothing you can do except be born again, to give up your life, and to accept a new life that Jesus, that the Messiah, the Son of Man is going to win for you by giving up His very own life. Now there's two things, powerful things that we take away. One is this, this truth that Nicodemus had to encounter. The fact that he had to give up something that he had believed in in order to really encounter God on a whole new level. We can focus on how much God loves us and how much God is willing to give up, and how much God is invested in us having a relationship with God. 
But one of the things that we can just kind of brush by in this conversation is the very fact that maybe we are embracing something that's preventing us from knowing God. Maybe we are embracing an attitude or an assumption or a value. Maybe we get it from our culture, from our parents, from our upbringing, from our experience. Maybe there's something, a very real thought or assumption or attitude in our lives that's creating a barrier between us and God. That's what's going on with Nicodemus. And maybe we need to have a conversation with Jesus or with someone else along these same lines to help dispel that falsehood from our life. In order to do that, we have to be willing to give up maybe something we've always placed our hope in for our entire lives. The Apostle Paul was very much going along this path. He was devoted to what he believed in. He was a zealot. He was someone that was utterly, to every extent that he could, devoted to God, yet he believed in a falsehood, and because of that, he was actually battling against God instead of following God. And so he has an encounter with Jesus. It's a humbling one, where he has to be led by the hand, where he's blinded, and he has to give up some of the core beliefs that he had always placed his hope in, in order to really place his hope in Jesus. So maybe during Lent, this season, as we're getting ready for Jesus, maybe that's what God is calling us, you and me, to do, is to have crucial conversations with people, to talk about what it is that might be between us and God, what barriers do we have, what false assumptions do we have. Maybe we need to challenge one another, maybe we need to be vulnerable and honest with one another. I know all the Republicans in the room are turning to the Democrats and saying, oh yeah, we need to have a conversation. And the Democrats are saying, oh, i got to save my Republican conservative brethren. No, we're not trying to make other people like us. But we have to be willing to have conversations where we're willing to let go of the things we place our hope in, in order to have our hope placed truly in God. So take time this week. Our takeaways, maybe for today, are this. What beliefs do we hold on to that are not from God? Lent is a season where we take stock of our spiritual, and physical, and emotional lives. Maybe this is something we need to take stock of, to ask ourselves, to journal, to think about this, to meditate on it. What are the things that we hold dear, beliefs or hopes that we have, that really aren't from God, but they're from our culture, our society, our family, or whatever? And then go to the next one. And then be courageous enough to have conversations about these very false beliefs, these false hopes, with someone who knows God a dear friend, a pastor, someone whom we respect, someone whom we've had conversations with before, maybe over breakfast or coffee, maybe at any time we get a chance, instead of just talking about the, the surface level things in our lives, have a conversation like Nicodemus had with Jesus, where we challenge one another, where we are willing to give up, change what we believe, what we place our hope in, in order to find the real hope that comes only in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's stand for our song of the day.